Okay. Yeah. Everybody, can you see the uh, yeah. slide? Yeah. Yes. Okay, we're good. Yep. All right, so today we're considering uh, Cairo and the Jewish community there. Uh, first, as we always do, we'll look at some of the historical background and then move into things of interest to Jews. So during the 12th century, uh, what were the issues in the, in the Near East? Well, one, which is still an issue, uh, uh, is what form of Islam will dominate Sunni versus Shia? And if you remember, mm -hmm. this dates back uh, to a dispute in the seventh century about who should follow Muhammad as a leader. The Shiites felt that it should be a relative of Muhammad and the Sunnis said, no, it should be somebody who was elected by the whole uh, group of Muslim leaders. Um, ultimately, the Sunni Islam uh, won out in terms of numbers. Right now, 85% of Muslims in the world are Sunnis and only 15% are Shia. Uh, but Egypt went back and forth uh, um, during the Middle Ages between Sunni and Shia. Another issue is, will Islam be united in one continuous caliphate, like the way the Abbasids were, which went all the way from Pakistan uh, through North Africa until it broke apart? Or will there be separate kingdoms or empires? Ultimately, it was going to be separate empires. Um, but when uh, people like... Um, uh, the and ISIS talk about the caliphate. They're talking about the Abbasid caliphate, which took most of the Arab and Persian world. Three, who will control the Holy Land? At this point, um, there, was, there were the Crusades, and specifically in the 12th century was the third crusade between Saladin, as we'll see, and um, Richard the Lionheart. Um, four, um, what should be the status of other religions, especially religions of the book, Christianity and Judaism? Should they be tolerated or should they be expelled? Generally speaking, in most of history of the Arab lands, uh, tolerance was the uh, was one out, although we've already seen one instance with the Almohads in Spain and Morocco where there was intolerance, but it was transitory for the most part. David, excuse me, question on that map. Is that Sicily, that's uh, green? Was that Muslim for a while? What, what are you asking? Sicily? Yeah, that green that's what it was. It was, it was uh, controlled by the Arabs for a while. One of the great things about one of the great things about Sicily is you can just get just about get every single culture ever existed in the Mediterranean world. It's got some of the best Greek sites you'll find. That's Roman what I sites, you know, Byzantine sites, and and for a while it was controlled by uh, by Arabs. It's true. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is that I found better Greek sites in Sicily than that's I did right. in Greece. That's right. absolutely that's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, anyway, this is the Fatimid Empire, which goes from Morocco into Saudi Arabia and into uh, the Holy Land. And th this was a group of Shiites who were in Tunisia, who then went on a conquering uh, um, mode and ended up um, conquering Egypt. Now, Egypt was one of the most important areas in, in the Mediterranean. Why? Why is Egypt important? Because of the river, the Nile? That's right. And what does the Nile then allow uh, uh, to happen? Well, they could grow year round. They weren't desert. Agriculture is not the year round, but it, with the flood, you have nutrients and water and you can you know, make canals and all the rest. And so it became the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. It was the breadbasket during the Roman times. 
they could not have have fed all the people in the city of Rome without having uh, wheat uh, um, imported from uh, from Egypt. So even at, at this point, it was critical, and it, and today it's the most populous. No, it's the second most populous. Uh, uh, Islamic uh, uh, country, Indonesia is uh, greater. Actually, so is India, but it's the most populous Arab country. All right, well, for our purposes, um, when Maimonides left from Morocco, uh, he first went to Jerusalem, but th within a year, he decided to move to Egypt. We're not exactly sure why, but we'll talk about it in a bit. In any case, by this time, a new ruler uh, controlled uh, Egypt, and that was the Ayyubid Caliphate, and, and Salah ad-Din was the first major sultan. So his empire did not extend too far into North Africa, but was all the way into Iraq, all the holy sites in Saudi Arabia, and notice the green. The, these are the crusader controlled lands. As you know, at the end of the 11th century, the first crusade uh, essentially conquered all of what's now Israel and uh, most of Lebanon and some parts of Syria. Um, this is the territory that was controlled when Maimonides arrived and they had extended their territory. And if you notice, there's no more green, okay? In other words, the Crusaders were driven out of most of the tiny little space still there around Acre. So Salah ad -Din was, a, was a major conqueror. And what was interesting, here he is, mm. it's, a it's a modern bust of Salah ad -Din. He was actually um, uh, not an Arab, he was a Kurd uh, from, uh, actually from born in Tikrit, uh, Iraq. And because he was a minority, he had a lot of sympathy for other minorities. He was quite good for the Jews, as we will see. A very charismatic uh, uh, person. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie, the, King, the Kingdom of Heaven. Anybody? Raise your hand. Anybody seen it? 2005, it's about uh, the conquest of Jerusalem by Maimonides. Uh, it's really a, a, a terrific uh, a movie in the sense of how realistic it is in bringing back that period of time. And it documents when Jerusalem fell again to, to the Muslims. Uh, it, here's a depiction of one of the critical battles pri prior to the uh, conquest of Jerusalem. Uh, and this is the Battle of Hattin, which is uh, shown in this movie. So here's Saladin on the march. And this is the surrender of the Crusaders after the Battle of Hattin. Now, when Maimonides first came to this area, the Kingdom of Jerusalem uh, had, had, you know, had Jerusalem, but also a piece of what's now Lebanon, a piece of what's now Jordan, a little bit of Egypt. And then, as I say, that was totally reduced, except for an area, a small area around Acre. Yeah. So that's... Now, did it become a more attractive place for Jews to live? Yes, it did, after the Crusaders left. All right. Now, let's talk about the Jewish community uh, um, in, in Cairo a bit, where they live and where the main city is. Um, the city of Cairo, which is, you know, right on the Nile River, is north of, of a, essentially a suburb at that time called Fustat. Now it's part of Cairo, you know, uh, expanded Cairo. But at this time, um, it took about one hour by donkey ride to go from Fustad to the palace where Maimonides had to go every day. All right. So the, this, this was a, a, a fairly large Jewish community, not as large as the city of Alexandria, 
which we talked about a couple of sessions ago. Now, Cairo was, um, here's some of the neighborhoods of Cairo. And what I want to point out to you is this citadel and palace area in the southern part of Cairo. And then down here off the, the map is where Fustat was. You can see it here. Here's the citadel. Here's, here's Fustat. Now, um, a bit about general education. Just like we saw the Kairouan University in Morocco, remember that? You know, the oldest university mm -hmm. in the world, right? Mm -hmm. This is almost as old. This is the Al Aqsar mm -hmm. Mosque and University, which was founded by the Fatimids in 972 CE. So if you wanted to study medicine, philosophy, mathematics, et cetera, et cetera. This was the best place to go. And it's still a university. There are, you know, religious uh, studies that you can, uh, you can use, uh, partake. And they're also non-religious, uh, such as pharmacology and certain sciences that are still being taught there. The mosque is a, a, a quite, quite beautiful place. Yeah, you know, this is the central courtyard. So these universities all had mosques attached uh, to them. This is a picture from the 19th century uh, or the beginning of the 20th century. You know, he, here's the, um, the citadel, part of which was built by Salah ad -Din. Now, what about the Jewish world? Um, well, first of all, we know that most of the Jews at this time lived in the Arab controlled parts of the world. 90% of Jews at this time were Sephardim. Only 10% lived in Europe. So this was before the big uh, migration of Jews into Poland and uh, you know, other areas of Europe. Um, and so there were certain nodal points of Jewish life, south of Spain, Morocco, Egypt, Baghdad, et cetera, that were absolutely critical uh, for the maintenance of Jewish life and for uh, Jewish scholarship. Now, we don't have, uh, obviously, we don't have pictures or even we don't have drawings of what Fustat looked like. Um, but he, here, from descriptions that we have, they're very much like uh, what Fustat looked like um, in the 19th century. There's a drawing of it. Jews really liked these uh, porches for some reason, uh, maybe because it was cooler to sleep in. Um, and this is the Ben Ezra synagogue. And if you go to Egypt, uh, Right now, the Egyptian government actually is fostering trips of Jews to Egypt. They paid for the refurbishment of the Ben Ezra synagogue. So they want tourists. Now, why is the Ben Ezra synagogue important? Anybody know? It has the Cairo Geniza. That's right. Ah. All right, now, what is a Geniza? Um, this, yeah, is just, this is just the entrance to the, to the before the, before the refurbishment. This is what was the entrance to the synagogue. Here's the refurbished inside of the synagogue. That's beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. And this is a depiction of the Cairo Geniza. Now, if, if God's name was on any document, it could not be destroyed. It either was buried in the ground or it was placed in a, uh, a storage area. In the Ben Ezra synagogue, this storage area was um, on the, essentially at the height of the second floor. And it was sealed unless documents were being put in. Now, when people wrote to one another, they very frequently mentioned God, like 
God bless you or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Let God give you this or that. And as soon as that hit the paper, it had to, it could not be destroyed. So there were millions ultimately of documents that were placed in the Geniza from the ninth century to like the 13th century. Excuse me, I don't mean to be stupid. What is the Geniza? The Geniza is the place of storage. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's the place of storage. Like right here is the Geniza. You see, mm -hmm. can you see this? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, so in here it was piled up thousands and thousands of documents. And they were discovered in uh, the uh, 19th century, the end of the 19th century. And it created a tremendous stir. Why? Because if you're not only are you interested in Jewish history, if you're interested in medieval history, it was a, a, a treasure trove because people would talk about what the price of bread was and this and that. And, and so th there was a trove of data that was available to historians and it's still being mined, so to speak, by historians to this to this day. Somebody going to ask a question? <laughs> David, is that where they found the Masoretic text, that old one that they're now using as sort of a base? I don't know. Isn't that? I don't know no? about okay. that. I don't know about that. Um, I don't but, think so. That, that was Lynn? That was me. I don't think that's where the Masoretic text was found. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Now, a lot of times when people would write a letter, they would also write a copy of that letter, you know, because it wasn't like uh, FedEx that you could be fairly certain something <laughs> arrived, right? You know, it was more like the U.S. Post Office where you didn't know whether it was going to arrive. So they kept a copy, but you couldn't if you if that copy contained the uh, you know the uh, God's name, you couldn't destroy that either, and you'd eventually have to put that in the in the in the Geniza. Now, Solomon uh, Schechter was one of the people who uh, uh, did the work on the Geniza. This is a picture of him in Cambridge with all these documents. They went to various places. They went to New York. They went to Russia. They went to, uh, the bulk of them went to England. And now they're on, um, you know, they're digitized. Um, Okay, so in that are their uh, uh, <laughs> copies, handwritten copies of, of Maimonides' letters, uh, of uh, some of his works. It's just an amazing uh, uh, drove of, of, of data. So let's consider now Maimonides' life in Egypt. We've already gone over his life in Spain and in Morocco. But in the year 1168, when he was 30 years old, the family first goes to Jerusalem and then ultimately moves to Fustat. And, you know, the, the people don't know exactly why he moved, but it most likely is the fact that it was much better for Jews in the Arab lands. And there was a community, a thriving community in Fustat. Um, and there was a protection uh, from the, uh, the Sultan. Uh, now in 1169, Saladin becomes the ruler of Egypt. And as I mentioned, he was noted for his compassion for minorities. He'll play a role later in Maimonides' life since, they, since Maimonides became his physician. Now we will discuss in some detail the mission of Torah and the guide to the perplexed at the end of the lecture. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into great detail, but from some of the other works, I will talk about them as we go along. But notice that in 1170, at the age of 32, he begins his magnum opus, the Mishnah Torah, which was a codification of Jewish law. It's an amazing work and it took him 10 years to complete. And we'll go into why it's important in a bit. Now, in certain areas of the Arab world, as I mentioned, on, uh, um, there were at times fluorescence of um, anti-Semitism. And already Maimonides was um, famous in the Muslim world 
uh, by 1172 because he had already written a number of, of works. And the Jews of Yemen wrote to him because some of them had been forced to convert to Islam. And they basically wanted to come back into the Jewish religion and some of the Jewish rabbis opposed their coming back. So um, Maimonides wrote a famous letter to them uh, assuaging their suffering and also saying that uh, as far as he were con is concerned, if somebody is forced to convert, they haven't converted and they're still Jews. Now in, in 1174, a terrible event occurred uh, to Maimonides and his family. His brother David, who had essentially been the, the leader in the family business, the family business was the jewel, jewel, you know, the importation of jewels. Uh, he drowned on his way to India. The work that David was doing was really allowing Maimonides to devote himself to scholarship. You know, and you know, the money was coming in from, from essentially David's work. And Maimonides went into a terrible depression that lasted a year. He was essentially bedridden for a year. And there was a letter in the Geniza written eight years later that described this bout of depression and his feelings about it. Uh, I'll just read it to you. The greatest misfortune that has befallen me during my entire life, worse than anything else, was the demise of the saint, may his memory be blessed, who drowned in the Indian Sea, carrying much money belonging to me and to him and to others, and left with me a little daughter and a widow. So he had now, he married himself later, but he now had the responsibility of taking care of his widow, uh, his brother's widow and daughter. On the day I received that terrible news, I fell ill and remained in bed for almost a year, suffering a sore boil, fever, and depression, and was almost given up. So people wondered whether he was going to live. About eight years have passed, but I'm still mourning and unable to accept consolation. And how should I console myself? He grew up on my knees. He was my brother, and he was my student. A very compelling, I think, um, letter. And, you know, it just shows the humanity uh, of this man. You know, nobody's beyond the, the hand of suffering in this life. It just, you know, it, it, that's the, what the Buddhists say, that the only promise that life always keeps is suffering. In 1175, he marries. We don't know his, his, his wife's name. She was the daughter of a rabbi. Uh, and at this point, after recovering from his depression, he starts to practice medicine. Now, he already studied medicine in Spain and in Morocco. So it was like he was, you know, he already had studied it, but he'd never practiced it. Now he supports his... Um, family um, uh, by being a physician. Now, in 1180, he finishes the Mishnah Torah, which we'll discuss la later. And five years later, uh, a, a, uh, somebody who's going to be very important in Maimonides' life, Joseph Ben Eknan, comes to Fustat to study from Iraq. Now, um, if you look at the areas of the world that were most important at this time for study, Iraq was still at the top. They had yeshivas there in uh, Pumpadita and an other town in Sura in, in, in Iraq. And they would also take questions from all over the Jewish world. Let's say you had an issue and you didn't know exactly what, what, you know, what the answer was about how to deal with it, you would write a, a, uh, a letter to one of these yeshiva, and they would send what's called a response back with the answer. And this was also a way for the, for the, um, for the yeshivas to make money. 
because you, you, you wouldn't just send a letter, you send a letter with money <laughs> if you wanted to get an answer back. So it was a money-making kind of thing. Anyway, Joseph comes to Fustat because of the fame of Maimonides, even though he's from Iraq and, and has the resources of the Iraqi community at his disposal. We know that Maimonides had one son, Abraham. He had a, a daughter who didn't survive infancy, and Abraham becomes a uh, famous rabbi uh, in his own right and with, with his own writings later on. Now, in 1187, he, Maimonides is made court physician, you know, which included Saladin, uh, by a vizier who had consulted him earlier. A vizier is like uh, prime minister. Um, and this friendship was very important to um, Maimonides over time because it essentially saved his life. Now, in Islam, if you convert to Islam, you are not allowed to go back to any other religion. They will kill you. It's a, it's a, it's a capital offense. Now, in Morocco, if you remember, it's highly likely that um, Maimonides and his family pretended to be Muslim. They didn't convert, but they pretended. In other words, don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. That, you know, they, 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 you know, people probably their friends knew they were Jewish, but they were keeping them hidden from the authorities because at that time there was anti-Semitism in, in Morocco. But there was a charge that was brought in Egypt by, by a, uh, a, a person from Morocco that said that Maimonides had converted and that therefore he should be put to death. So luckily for Maimonides and for us too, uh, the, the vizier Al-Fadil saves Maimonides' life and says that pretending to be Muslim is not converting to Islam. I don't know what that noise is. Okay, did you? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Now, there were two kinds of things that Maimonides wrote in terms of Jewish publications. One was for the general population. That was the Mishnah Torah, as we'll get into. That was written in clear Hebrew, simple Hebrew. Then there was the philosophical works, like the Guide for the Perplexed, that were written in Arabic for the elite. Okay? And so we'll get into both of those in, in a bit. Now, in addition to these two types of publications, Maimonides wrote a number of medical uh, works. How did this come about? Well, often it was a request of a patient, usually a wealthy patient, who had a problem and wanted more information, or sometimes Maimonides simply wrote it on his own accord. And there, we have them, uh, and they're very, very interesting uh, in the sense that even though Maimonides, as all of the other physicians of the time, relied on, on uh, Galen and, and uh, Greek uh, medicine, you know, that it talked about the, the four humors and all that, he still had very interesting insight especially to the psychosomatic aspects of disease, like asthma. He realized, for example, that it, it, living in a congested uh, area of the city with a lot of dust and everything else made asthma worse, and he recommended that people with asthma move out. He also talked about the fear that people have about asthma, how that makes it worse, and that you should use ways of trying to allay somebody's fears. That kind of psychosomatic insight is way beyond others of the time. Um, there's some funny stuff in there. He's got a, a whole thing on sex that uh, a uh, Arab uh, official wanted. This was a uh, man who had a very large harem. And he, he was concerned that he wasn't able to perform as much as he wanted. 
You mean you didn't well, have any Viagra? Well, I had no Viagra then, although Maimonides did, uh, you know, prescribe certain uh, certain herbs, which are totally worthless. <laughs> essentially, he had to try and diplomatically tell the guy that he was uh, overstretching himself, okay, that he just couldn't sleep with, you know, 50 women a week and expect that he'd be able to, um, you know, uh, perform. But you had to be careful when you said something like that, because you didn't want to hurt the manhood of the person who you were uh, writing this thing for. So it's interesting reading. And, uh, but he sort of, you know, slips in sort of warnings about licentiousness. Doesn't exactly define it, but he said, you know, you, you, you have to save it up if you, want, if you want it to be successful, you know, that kind of thing. I just, it's just funny. One of the things that he did do that was used for decades and centuries really was a pharmacopoeia of the time. And it was each, each entry was in four different languages, Hebrew, Arabic, Latin, and Greek. And uh, this was a major uh, um, uh, uh, contribution. Also, he wrote a medical text that was used for uh, a century or two afterwards in, in, in medical schools in the form of aphorisms. So, you know, he, he was truly... Uh, a Renaissance man, even though the Renaissance hadn't occurred yet, hadn't occurred yet. I mean, you know, he was, you know, he was a, a writer of uh, Jewish works. He was a writer of medical works and um, a truly a, a, an amazing uh, person. Now, just to give you some idea of what his life was, was like a daily life, there's a, there was a famous letter that was in the Geniza that was to his pup, his translator. Now, mostly uh, Maimonides wrote in Arabic. And so he didn't want to bother translating it into Hebrew. So he had somebody in Europe, uh, Samuel Ibn Tibbon, who wanted to translate it into Hebrew so the people in, in Europe who didn't speak Arabic could, could read. And uh, Ibn Tibbon was in the south of France and he wanted, he, he sent a letter asking Maimonides whether it was okay for him to visit, okay? And my, this is the letter about that Maimonides sent him back, which is basically the, the, the upshot was, don't visit. <laughs> I just don't have any time. So here, here, here's a bit of the letter. I live in Fustat and the Sultan resides in Cairo. These two places are two Shabbat limits marked off areas around the town within which it is permitted to move on Shabbat approximately one and a half miles distant from each other. My duties to the Sultan are very heavy. I'm obliged to visit him every day early in the morning. And when he or any of his children or concubines are indisposed, I cannot leave Cairo, but must stay during most of the day in the palace also frequently happens that one or two of the officers in an army fall sick and I must attend to their healing. Hence, as a rule, every day early in the morning, I go to Cairo and even if nothing unusual happens, I do not return to Fusta until the afternoon. Then I am famished and I find the antechambers filled with people, both Jews and Gentiles, nobles and common people, judges and policemen, friends and enemies, a mixed multitude, who await the time of my return. I dismount from my animal, wash my hands, go forth to my patients. So these are pa private practice, so to speak, patients, and entreat them to bear with me while I partake of some light refreshment, the only meal I eat in 24 hours. Then I go to attend to my patients and write prescriptions and directions for their ailments. Patients go in and out until nightfall and sometimes even as the Torah is my faith until two hours and more into the night, I converse with them and prescribe for them even while lying down from sheer fatigue. When light falls, I am so exhausted that I can hardly speak. In consequence of this, no Israelite can converse with me or befriend me on religious or community matters except on Shabbat. On that day, the whole congregation, or at least the majority, 
comes to me after the morning service when I instruct them. He, by this time, he's a he, he's a communal leader, uh, uh, you know, of, of the Jews of Fustat, and he's a judge. We study together a little until noon when they depart. Some of them return and read with me after the afternoon services until evening prayer. In this manner, I spend the days. I have here related to you only a part of what you would see if you were to visit me. I, I always get tired just reading that. <laughs> it's just not, not actually doing it. I mean, I can't imagine living, living that way. But he was a very busy fellow right up until his last day. So in 1204, at the age of 66, he dies. Now, where he's buried is a point of contention. Some people believe he's buried in um, the Galilee. And here, here's the um, tomb it's on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Other people claim that he was buried in Fustat. So we, we don't know. Here's, here's the stone that's uh, in, in the Galilee. All right, any questions before we move on to the Mishnah Torah and uh, Guide for the Perplexed and then and, and look at some uh, quotations from Maimonides? Any questions, comments? All right, so look at, let's, let's talk about the Mishnah Torah. Maimonides felt that, you know, First of all, that most Jews did not have a Talmud they could read, number one. Number two, they didn't speak or read Aramaic. So essentially, they simply had to rely on rabbis to tell them what the law was. And he wanted to get around this. And so what he did was essentially, in an organized fashion, because the Talmud is not organized, talked about the law as it, as, it, as it pertains to just about everything that could occur in the life of a Jew. So that you could take this book, it was written in simple but clear Hebrew, and get your own answer about how to solve a problem that you were having in terms of what the Jewish law. Now, this, this caused a flurry of opposition by rabbis. Okay, they just, you know, first of all, my, my monitor said, A, that you shouldn't be paid as a rabbi. In other words, all religious uh, undertakings should be done for God, not for money. So he, he never took a dime for any of the work that he did with the community as a rabbi. But in addition to that, here he's giving the average Jew the chance to answer his own or her own questions, which obviously was not a, a popular idea among many rabbis who criticized. They also criticized him because he did not footnote this work, okay? Now, the reason why he says he didn't footnote it, he wrote this for the common man, and that putting tons of footnotes in there would simply get in the way of whatever. Later generations, um, actually went ahead and footnoted it uh, and showed that Maimonides had backup for everything that he, you know, claimed. But that, but the lack of footnotes was another criticism of him at this time. Um, also, Maimonides was, uh, came out against the idea of demons or magic or any of the kinds of that stuff that was in the Talmud. He was totally against those kinds of concepts. But um, through time, most Jews believe that this is the best summary of the Talmud that's ever been created. And it, it's one of his major works, which took him over 10 years to complete. Now, the other work that we're going to consider is the guide for the, uh, for the perplexed. And this is not written for the common man. In fact, if you look at the beginning of it, it warns you. You're going to have to work really hard to try and decipher what I'm saying here. This is for the very, very scholarly person. The other reason 
that his language was sometimes hard to decipher. The meaning was hard to decipher, was that he was saying very controversial things in this work. This work was his attempt to normalize uh, the, the, the writings of Aristotle and other great Greek um, writers with Judaism. And as a result, uh, first of all, many Jews felt that bringing in Greek philosophy uh, in, into writing was uh, uh, dangerous and could lead people in the wrong di uh, direction. The other thing is that he goes up against uh, certain Jewish beliefs and essentially reinterprets them in a way that negates some concepts, just like I mentioned his attitude about magic, astrology, all of these kinds of things was extremely uh, negative. So what, what are some of the major thoughts that are presented? One, <laughs> reason and faith are not contradictory, okay? So he feels that things that, for the most part, that are described uh, to faith can be reconciled you know, with uh, reason, I mean, whether, you know, uh, the, the miracle is talking about uh, lightning or whatever, he, he's trying to normalize these things uh, in, in the guide and trying to uh, um, lead you away from a magical interpretation. And he says the Bible should not be taken literally, okay? In other words, he'll say, he doesn't change the words of the Torah. No, he doesn't do that. But he will say, well, it, the way it's written was not really what God meant. What God meant was et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, God is not anthropomorphic. God is not, does not have a hand, does not have a leg, does not have a, a, an eye. No, no. Um, it's just, that's just a phrase to try and help, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, Jewish person to, especially the simple uh, or uneducated Jewish person, to try and understand or make sense of how events occurred. But he's, he essentially uses this device. It's not what, it, in other words, it, the writer or God did not mean it literally as it is written. Now, you know, uh, many scholars of the day said, no, every word is just exactly as written. There aren't, there aren't other meanings to it, okay? God didn't, did have a hand or whatever. Uh, and so, you know, the, and, and if, if you see the way Judaism has developed over the centuries, people have come more and more towards Maimonides' idea that you know, the, the way it's written is not necessarily exactly the way it was meant. Um, now, uh, Spinoza said that Maimonides didn't go far enough in terms of his uh, assertions. But first of all, we don't know what Maimonides really believed, but we do know that it was dangerous to go, look what happened to, to, uh, to Spinoza, right? He was excommunicated. So, you, you know, there's just, you can just bring it so far with science uh, until you reach a point where at least a, a good number of people in, in the religion will start to oppose you. And Maimonides find, found this out uh, when he questioned resurrection and had to back off and say, well, yeah, well, maybe, maybe it really did happen, even though it was obvious that he, he made an assertion that it didn't, and then he, he, he had to back up. Now, I took some quotes from the guide, from, uh, you know, the Mishnah Torah, and from all of Maimonides' writings and try to give you a flavor for how he wrote. And now, here, here's his take on miracles, which he was, had real problems with. The laws remain undisturbed. Apparent exceptions, the miracles originate in these laws although man is unable to perceive the causal relation, okay? That we don't have the science right now to explain it, but it's not a miracle. It, it's, it, it, it's a natural phenomenon. Creation. 
the passage, and he rested on the seventh day, is interpreted as follows. On the seventh day, the forces and laws were complete, which during the previous six days were in the state of being established for the preservation of the universe. They were not to be increased or modified. So again, God is the um, author of natural law. Okay, the, the, you don't have to uh, posit a uh, contradiction between science and God. God created science, right? Education, the person who wishes to attain human perfection should study logic first, next mathematics, then physics, and lastly, metaphysics. Um, Okay, let's move ahead. Truth and wisdom. Truth does not become more true by virtue of the fact that the entire world agrees with it. Not less so even if the whole world disagrees with it. Okay, so, you know, don't be swayed by the fact that a bunch of people believe something. Think about it. Use your own mind, use your own logic and see what, what, you know, what you believe, not by the fact that a bunch of people believe it. Your purpose should always be to know the whole that was intended to be known. Okay. He wants people to study. He wants people to use their logic throughout their life. Okay. You must accept the truth from whatever source it comes. So whether you uh, like the person or not, if what they say makes sense, makes logical sense, you shouldn't undermine your belief because you don't like the person. In other words, the facts should speak for themselves. All right. Um, now there's many, 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 many more uh, here uh, that we could talk about. There's a couple of um, funny ones that I want to uh, relate. Um, where is it? Where is it? Oh, well, I, I, I get it. Maybe it's not here. You know, he's talking about um, circumcision, really crazy stuff. Compassion. Let's look compassion. It is a very important thing to him. It is better to acquit a thousand guilty persons than to put a single innocent one to death. Whoever rebukes his fellow man, whether concerning matters between the two of them or between him and God, needs to rebuke him in private. He shall speak to him calmly and gently and make known to him that he talks to him only for his own good to bring him to the life of the world to come. If he accepts it from him, good. If not, he shall rebuke him a second and third time. Thus, he is always obliged to rebuke him until the sinner strikes him and says to him, I will not listen, but all, always in private. I will destroy my enemies by converting them to friends. <laughs> It's great. He talked about, you know, different, different ways of being generous. And the best way of being generous is anonymous. Okay. In other words, you look for no gain whatsoever. That's the highest form of charity. The risk of a wrong decision is preferable to the terror of indecision. I like that one. Yeah. Astrology is a sickness, not a science. It is a tree under the shade of which all sorts of superstitions thrive. It is hard for a woman with whom an uncircumcised man has had sexual intercourse to separate from him. 
uh, in my opinion, this is the strongest reason for circumcision. So in other words, <laughs> somehow you can't uncouple from your lover unless you've been circumcised. <laughs> I don't know where he gets this one from, but, you know, obviously uh, he's wrong. Oh, but what about the premature aging in the next one? <laughs> the next uh, sentence. Hold firmly into your word. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Can you send us a that The last few pages are fascinating, and I'd love to read them more. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to send those or yeah, put them sure. somewhere where we can get it? Absolutely. Well, just tell me where to send it, and I will. All right. I'll put my uh, email in the chat when we get back. A friend of mine many, many, many years ago died, and he had a copy of the perplex that he had studied from. I ended up with it. I thumbed through it a couple of times, and then I donated it to the library here when I moved to Green Valley, uh, to the library in the synagogue. And every now and then, I'm sorry I did. You know, I, every now and then I, but it just looks so daunting, so impossible, you know, two, three inches thick of, you know, words that, words, words, words. Wh so, which, which, which book was this? I, I didn't catch the book. The actual, The Guide to the Perplexed. Uh, the, the, guy, yeah. the, gu the Guide to the Perplexed is a very, very difficult document. Exactly. Okay? There is a, uh, we use, in, in uh, we use the book to study the guide, which is written by a, a philosopher from uh, Northwestern, yeah. You have it, Lynn? Yeah, I'm looking for it. Kenneth Siskin. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I had the book. I tried a couple of times to get into it, couldn't, and I said, <laughs> oh, I'll put it in the library. I see it. Liz, Liz, got, Liz got the book, okay? It you is see it? Put, it? put us on, um, can we go on to gallery? Let's see. Well, when uh, actually, after... Uh, he unchat unscreens, you know, himself. We can chat. I can give you my email and you can put that title in the book. But I thought it would stay in the library, but Linda put it with you know books that anybody could take if they wanted. And somebody took it. Now I don't have it to go back and occasionally. Well, I, I wouldn't cry too much because it's probably an old translation. These are it's it's hard to read even well, with a modern translation. So, I mean, I would suggest Siskin's book because yeah. he, oh, he Look how feel, thin it is. <laughs> it's oh, not like him. That's so much better. Yeah. I mean, when, uh, when he stops screen sharing, we can, oh no, I can chat now. I'll give you my email in the chat. But then also, uh, if you could put the title of that book in the chat, then I can get it. Okay, I just chatted my email uh but all right well we'll we'll, we'll get you the, the copy of the yeah. uh, of the quotations and of yeah, the book. fascinating uh, the book, the book, the book is a very e easy read it's an easy read he really tries to break down the most important parts of of, of the guide and uh <clears throat> i think you'll be happy with it Thank you. I appreciate that because I certainly couldn't handle the whole thing. Yeah. Look in the chat. I see it. Yep. Thanks, Lynn. Is now I'm going to save the chat. Yeah. Norm, you got a, a question? I can't uh, hear you, Norm. You're on mute. No, he's not muted, but he's not. His mic isn't working. Okay. How's that? Okay. Yes. That's good. Sorry, sorry. Thanks. So I was interested in the question about resurrection. Uh, it was my, as my recollection is that that was one of the 13 principles of faith. So eventually he must have come out in support of the doctrine. Um, yes. So he, he, he did, he did. Uh, that is, you're right. It's one of the 13 uh, principles. But, um, my understanding is that in letters or whatever, you know, he questioned it. And then when he was pressed on it, he okay. uh, decided that he put it, he's going to put it back. Yeah. And, okay. you know, it's like, uh, 
you, you, you have to know how far you can go. You know, it's like the Chinese say, you know, the, 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 uh, the, um, the tongue is the enemy of the neck. You know, uh, you got to watch what you say because, you know, it, it can be dangerous. Look what happened to Galileo, right? Yes. They put they, they were going to kill him if he didn't uh, uh, renege. So it, it, and, uh, you know, so it was dangerous for him. And you just wonder, you wonder whether in the privacy of his home, when he's just talking and he knows nobody's going to repeat it, what he really believed. Okay, how much of an Aristotelian was he, and how, and how you know how did he feel about certain parts of the Talmud or the Torah? But we'll never know. We'll never know. Uh, but you're right. It, it was one of the the, the uh, thirteen principles. It is in the Yigdal, you know, the prayer. Absolutely Thank right. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think um, in Maimonides' time that you pushed as hard as uh, like Spinoza did because um, it was to, to be separated from the community in the late 12th century was much more dangerous than to do that in the 17th century. Well, it, it's true what you say, but you have to remember somebody tried to kill Spinoza. Okay, so somebody was really pissed off. <laughs> Maybe in general, uh, you know, you, I think you're right, but it, it still was pretty, pretty uh, uh, um, chancy for for uh, even even at that point to go against uh, the state religion. And essentially, what I mean is that it wasn't just Jews that were upset by Spinoza. Spinoza felt that you couldn't say that the ruling monarch was uh, anointed by God. Well, if the ruling monarch's not anointed by God, why should they? Why necessarily should you, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, go along with what they have to say? So, in that sense, it was pretty dangerous what he what he did, and we don't know who tried to kill him, whether it was the Christians or the Jews. Yeah, but what I'm saying, the difference is he could survive. He had a profession, was a glass grinder or whatever, and he could support himself. Whereas um, in Maimonides' time, if you were excluded from the community, you wouldn't have any business. You wouldn't have a, a, a way to, unless somebody else was going to support you. Yeah, I think that's right. I agree. You know, uh, it was a very um, controversial book at the time. Two centuries, I think it was two centuries later, when Thomas Aquinas was looking at the same issue, which is how do you harmonize um, Aristotle with Christianity, he quoted Maimonides in depth. He had a tremendous amount of respect for Maimonides. So, uh, you know, Maimonides writing um, stood the test of time, but I think you're right. I think that you, he risked a lot if he pushed it too far. Anybody else? All right, we have one more left, and that is Amsterdam. You've got another question. Oh, sorry, didn't see oh, it. Oh, yeah, this Go is ahead. Gene Sheck. Yeah, um, it, it sounds like Maimonides did for Jews what Martin Luther did for Christians uh, when yeah, writing the Mishnah Torah, really putting into layman's terms um, some interpretation and that you know the rabbis got all ticked off with right. uh, with Maimonides, as did you know the Catholic Church get all ticked off at Martin Luther. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, generally yeah. speaking, people in authority don't like to lose influence. <laughs> they, they don't usually get all happy. Oh, gee, uh, uh, I don't have less influence now, and that's what Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther did to the Catholic Church. You know, he said, you don't have to listen to these people. You know, you, you, you know, read the Bible. I mean, very few Catholics read the Bible. OK, uh, they just didn't. And uh, well, it, was in Latin. What? it was in Latin, like, you know, who could read the Hebrew? What's your, you know, yeah. in the last 200 years, nobody read Latin or Hebrew right. except but the church fathers. I'm, I'm not sure how much I don't know about this, but I'm not sure how much the Catholic Church actually encouraged people to go and read rather than to, to memorize the catechism and no. that sort of stuff. 
No, they had the catechism that was taught and, you know, very specific. And just, you always went through your priest and up the line, right, chain right. of command right. mm -hmm. to get an answer. Right. They were strongly opposed to reading the Bible, which is why yeah. they were so hard on Wycliffe and, and Tyndall and the other English uh, clerics who first translated the Bible into English. That was absolutely right. terrible. It came out of a um, non-literary tradition compared to the situation of the Jews who were a smaller number. Like more Jews were literate than Christians taught by the images in their churches and cathedrals and from the uh, sermons of their clergy. That's how you learn, listening to lectures, sermons, and, and looking at, at all of the display of the um, representation of biblical tales and stories and figures. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll, in two weeks, we'll do Amsterdam in the Golden Age, and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on Spinoza and Rembrandt. Not that Rembrandt was a Jew, but he lived in the Jewish neighborhood, and he had a lot of clients that were Jews. Um, and that'll finish up the series. Well, it's been a great series so far. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.